Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, especially to those who made it into, into the premises, but also uh, thank you for those uh, who are joining us uh, online. Uh, it's my great pleasure to chair this event, um, this hybrid event at the IIEA. And we're delighted to welcome David Hennig uh, uh, today. Who, David is the director of uh, UK Trade Policy Project at the European Center for International Political Economy. And we're really pleased that he's made time for us today uh, in his very busy schedule. David's gonna talk for about 20 minutes uh, and there's going to be uh, lots of uh, time for questions at the end. Uh, if there were issues to be clarified, we can probably take them during the, uh, during the talk, but we leave the questions uh, to the end. People on, uh, online can uh, share their questions with their questions and answers function on uh, the Zoom. And I'm going to be able to read those out uh, when we get to that. Um, one reminder is that uh, uh, this event is on the record, uh, so that uh, is, should be borne in mind. Uh, some events that we've had at the IAEA previously might have been off the record or Chatham House rules. Uh, this is on the record. For anyone who's on Twitter, uh, there's a Twitter handle IAEA, uh, which you might want to use if you want to share some of your impressions uh, of today's talk uh, online. Um, I'm going to just say a few words about David uh, before I hand over to him. Uh, David, as I said, is the director of trade, uh, UK Trade Policy Project uh, at the think tank European Centre for International Political Economy. And I've actually followed David a little bit on Twitter. He doesn't know that. Uh, um, and he's, he's been uh, giving very, very interesting analysis, uh, uh, both on uh, Brexit, uh, UK's trade and trade policy, and also on the UK economy. And I think today's talk will we'll, uh, look at, at all three. Um, David has served as expert advisor to the UK Trade and Business Commission and the House of Lords, so he's really well placed to, to give us uh, some very interesting insights. Um, and prior uh, to uh, joining the ECIPE, he was actually working in the UK government. Uh, so uh, again, that puts him into an extremely uh, good position to uh, give us some very valuable insights. Uh, with that, I'm going to hand over to David, 20 minutes or so, and then we'll do questions and answers. David. Thank, thank you, Edgar. Thank you, uh, Barry, for... Uh, the, the invite to come here and uh, talk. We were actually talking a few months ago, I think it was uh, during the very short prime ministerial reign of Liz Truss, we were talking about doing an event on, uh, on the UK economy. But I think that things just moved a bit too fast then to, uh, <laughs> you know, by the, by, by the time we, we, we thought, well, when should we do this? Liz Truss had ceased to be prime minister. And that's kind of... <laughs> That was the sort of that's kind of been the story of the U, the, uh, the UK economy for the last uh, for the last few years is that uh, whenever we were worried that it was kind of you know we were doing badly we didn't need to worry because there's some more, worse news was coming on the way um, and when when I compare it to the Irish economy judging by what I see from over the water and what I've seen wandering around this morning um, you know it, it is quite the contrast um, or. I will say that it does appear that finally the, uh, you found a way to keep the Brits out of uh, Ireland by making it too expensive for us to come here. Um, so let me talk about the UK economy. Let me talk about whatever happened to global Britain. Let me talk about a little bit about Brexit. Let me talk about what might come next because we are quite likely to have a change of government. So what does the new government think about the economy? So let me try and package that up. There's lots of different directions that I'm happy to answer questions on from details of the Windsor framework, which I have to, to look at for my work to broader questions of globalization and what's happening next. And so I kind of cover, cover all bases there. Therefore, I don't quite have time to have the, the kind of detailed study. So I haven't actually carried out the kind of detailed modeling studies that many others have done there. So this is necessarily a sort of big picture overview. 
And what I would say to start with is this is probably the gloomiest moment for the UK economy since the late 1970s. Um, inflation higher than G7 average, growth forecast generally lower, trade performance disappointing. This is not the Brexit brochure. Um, you know, it's not, it's not the end of the UK. I mean, we're not writing off the UK as a global uh, player. We've still got the soft power. We're still a services superpower. We're still significant in defense, diplomatic networks. Um, we still have many global, global companies, but we're clearly not in a great place economically for, for, fu for future growth. And there is not, <laughs> there's not a, good, a great degree of posit positivity around. So yeah, let's, let's look at Brexit and the change in globalization and what that's going to, what's that, that's going to mean. The UK talked about being a global leader as a result of Brexit. Clearly that is dissipating. That's just disappearing from, 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 from view. It's now very much around damage limitation. But yeah, we're not rejoining. We can't relitigate 2016. So where does the UK realistically go from here? And we have to start with Brexit. There is no question that um, the last seven years of Brexit politically has shaken UK confidence profoundly. It's almost become an unmentionable in UK politics. Neither the Conservative Party, but not even Labour can really speak openly about the effects of Brexit. You could not get a, politi a leading politician from either main party to talk about what's been happening on the on the economy we get now make brexit work as kind of profound um this next part the most obvious part you will not get many politicians to say that the greater the trade barriers the lower the trade especially with your nearest neighbor i mean it seems so obvious and yet um the last few years have, have shaken any discussion of it even more so when most trade is now carried out in supply chains, and that's where the services all goods trade, it's all part of larger transactions. And when many of those supply chains are regional rather than global, you are putting up barriers to those supply chains operating. You are particularly putting them up on manufacturing, where uh, you're not only threatening to have different regulations on everything, you have potential tariffs, you have a lot more border paperwork, it's easy relatively easier if you're a large company, if you are a small company that was supplying an industrial product to a German uh, end manufacturer, you've just suddenly increased your costs compared to competitors. You're also finding it a lot more difficult now to find any new customers. That is, is very much what, what's happening there. Um, all of our neighbors now, Every single one, if you've got a company in that in, in 30 or so countries, they will face less barriers to trade than a UK company. And that's quite a, a shocking thing to, to, to say. So you're disadvantaged by being based in the UK, which is why a lot of UK companies are setting up facilities elsewhere. They, set, they may set them up in, in Northern Ireland. Many are setting them up in the Netherlands, Germany, wherever it is. Um, that doesn't cover all UK trade because there is a, a large part of uk trade that involves um that is services and that doesn't the barriers don't really matter so much university students we're now so on some estimates higher education is now is one of the uk's two or three largest exports financial services it doesn't matter so much the english premier league however defined that's a huge revenue earner in various ways not affected it is the manufacturing. There is a relative shift going on in the UK from manufacturing into, into services. Um, and none of this feels in the remotest part sustainable. How can you have the UK kind of in a bubble on its own when all of our neighbours have, have more integration with, their, with each other? Um, you now start to see the barriers. If somebody wants to sell a product from the, U from the UK or from Great Britain, really more specifically, to Europe, they will come across barriers. We're coming across barriers when we travel to, uh, to, to Europe. Young people are starting to, to find the problem of not being able to, um, to, to do the jobs. And the demand for mobility 
for the youth mobility is growing and is again not really being picked up within UK uh, politics. Um, and the UK has never really been in this situation of being excluded from from Europe, perhaps in the nineteen in the nineteen sixties. But the world's economy and the way economies worked was much was very different then. Um, and that means that really all of this, the politics and the economics, ultimately are going to point towards the UK trying to find ways to to reduce those barriers. Um, the overall hit, various discussions, various methodologies around as to how you would calculate this. But we are, I think common consent is we are somewhere in the region of between four and 6% of GDP as an economic hit. And these, the, that number is off the scale. There is no policy intervention that in, in today's economy that anybody can think of that delivers a four to 6% hit or four to 6% uh, growth in, in, in GDP. An average trade deal might, on forecast, deliver you 0.1% of GDP. Um, Labour mobility, which is probably the, the, the thing that delivers you the most, maybe has uh, contributed perhaps 1% to, uh, to, to UK GDP because we have kept relatively open, uh, open borders. But um, it is a huge hit. Now, it was supposed to be offset by global Britain. I think you may have come across that phrase, and I think a lot of people were finding it quite a humorous phrase. A lot of people from outside the UK, quite a lot inside the UK, even before uh, recent months when it quite clearly wasn't happening. So the idea is we would offset losses from EU trade. Uh, we'd have new trade deals. We'd reduce tariffs. We'd have more nimble regulation. And... What's interesting in the last few months is how that's not, not a lot of that's not being heard so much any, anymore because it's not working. Um, yes, we've got trade deals with Australia and New Zealand, but they're not, they're not going to deliver much and they're already running into problems over unhappy farmers. Trade deals tend to lead to unhappy farmers because the remaining tariffs in place that they reduce are on agricultural produce. Um, we've joined the a uh, comprehensive and progressive agreement for the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the CPTPP, uh, 11 countries, but we already had trade deals with uh, nine of them. Malaysia is the, the major uh, new country there, so that will deliver a little bit, um, but there's a problem there as well. So that's a, a mega regional with, um, which is designed to encourage regional um, value chains to emerge between Asia-Pacific countries. The UK is not going to be part of those value chains by and large, those supply chains, because we're too far away. So we're more likely to be a customer. So if you like, it may give us the benefit of having an alternate source of goods from China, but it is not going to do much for our manufacturing. So if anything, it's going to continue the trend away from manufacturing towards services, which was not what Brexit was supposed to deliver. Um, Goods exports anyway are going down from the uh, from the UK. Service exports are, are performing okay. Um, we've lost half our car production since 2016. Now, a lot of European countries have lost car production since 2016, but the difference was that in most cases, they've started, there's been a little bit of a bounce back in the last couple of years, but not in the UK. We're down from 1.6 million to just under 800,000. And no obvious way that's going to increase we're kind of behind on electric vehicles we don't have we only have one geiger factory to support our nissan plant um so our car industry is looking is looking tricky uh honda closed in 2021 that was a major source of exports to the us of goods because they exported their cars there um so and we don't have uh, a large goods exporter to the U uh, to the to the us a car exporter uh once, once they once they've gone and the US itself is a problem, of course, because the US is turning to protectionism at the very moment when the UK would like to export more there. So the whole uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, Biden, but it started with Trump, of course, Trump was already turning away from trade and saying free trade agreements are bad for the US. Biden has made it even more obvious that that's what he believes. The UK doesn't have that opportunity. So as part of the conservative right, they were backing Brexit. They felt that the US was the, the sort of the replacement for the EU. Well, that's not only not happened, that looks in no prospect of, hap of happening. Um, meanwhile, you've got the EU 
basically trying to regulate the net zero tra uh, transition for the world through carbon border adjustment mechanisms, uh, various deforestation, various green um, uh, regulations, which UK companies are going to have to follow. So the idea of being more nimble doesn't really work. We can choose to not have regulations on, for example, deforestation, but our companies are going to have to follow the EU ones anyway. Um, and there's not much of an agenda beyond uh, what we've already had. There, is, there are ongoing trade talks with India. There, it's not clear what's going on, but it's not likely to lead to a particularly ambitious trade deal as far as we can tell. There's a few renegotiations with the likes of Switzerland, South Korea, Canada. Again, not clear that will lead to a lot more than we already, that we already have. And so global Britain is now surrounded by a kind of a gloom, almost, oh, you know, that, that was an idea, but it's all gone wrong. And even among the Brexit supporters, you now get this idea Brexit was never tried properly. We might pick that up again later. Um, what happens next? There's a Labour, probably a Labour government, um, probably a general election in October next, next year. Um, trade and international economics are barely Labour issues. Labour is normally going to focus more on social policy, public, uh, uh, public services. Um, but to do that, they're going to need to find some growth from somewhere. Um, so there's a certain inevitability, and Labour is more instinctively pro-EU. They don't have a large proportion of uh, backbench and member opinion that the EU is somehow wrong and bad. So Labour will in some way want to rebuild ties to the EU and try to rebuild supply chains, but without talking about it, as I mentioned earlier. Um, so they'll try, I think, to deepen the trade and cooperation agreement, to uh, make trade in food products, for example, easier with a veterinary agreement, some mutual recognition of uh, manufactured products, conformity assessment, um, possibly something about professional qual qualifications, various easements of barriers, but the barriers will still be there. They will not change the fundamentals that the UK will, companies in the UK will face higher barriers than companies outside the UK and all of our neighbours. Um, there may be a little bit of a benefit from Labour just from stability, just from not being a Conservative Party that seems intrinsically anti-business, anti-EU. Anti that may help a little bit in terms of, uh, in, in terms of investment. Um, but there is a limit how much this is likely to, to deliver. We are back to trade agreements that might deliver 0.1 or 0.2% of, of GDP as against the 4% loss. And the loss was not just from the trade barriers, it was also from the kind of uncertainty and poor handling. Um, what's Labour going to do about regulation? I think it will just align now and say we're going to align with EU regulations where possible, which will at least be some stability there. But again, it doesn't feel like a stable outcome. So what I'm expecting to happen is that by the late 2020s, we will be back in the, we finally will be able to have the discussion, well, what does the UK now do about the EU? In the meantime of which I suspect the economy will have changed a little bit. It will be more, even more services dominated than it was before because that is where um, it's easier to do business internationally than in manufacturing where there are obvious barriers. Um, so, this government has slowed up already. I mean, just some concluding thoughts. This government has already slowed up on their, on their agenda. Uh, and what Labour's planning to do doesn't quite look adequate to a UK economy that is, is in this state of, state of gloom. There's nothing that seems to suggest that we're going to turn this round and suddenly become a star performer. You do have some idea that Labour will do something around the green economy, but so everybody's doing something about the green economy. Um, We've got serious problems with manufacturing. There is a possibility that that transformation that is already going on in the UK economy from manufacturing to services, actually, maybe we've already taken most of the hit, the economic hit, and that actually a government that focused on UK strengths, and but this would be politically difficult and basically less on manufacturing, that the economy might be able to strengthen from that. But that is going to be probably politically impossible. Um, so, yeah, whereas, for example, in the UK, 
um, expanding universities would seem an obvious policy which had economic benefit. Will Labour be able to actually to do that? Um, we'll certainly need greater, better infrastructure regionally. I think that we will carry on on the road back towards closer relations with the EU. But I don't think I don't think there'll be a conversation about rejoining the EU in the next five years. But I think we'll start to there'll start to be more conversations about the single market and the customs union. Um, and for the moment, um, we are back to the UK gloom that was around in the 1970s before Margaret Thatcher became prime minister of kind of uh, what was called declinism, the UK in, in permanent decline. Um, and it's not yet clear that we've got the answers to coming out of that decline and Brexit and the politics of the last seven years and the kind of almost a collective nervous breakdown that we've had is going to make it awfully difficult in the next few years to find our path out, but that is the challenge the UK has. I'll stop there, Edgar.